Good afternoon. It is a great pleasure to be part of this wonderful and somewhat experimental encounter. Many thanks to the conveners for giving me this opportunity. Many thanks to Natalie for the introduction and thank you to everyone watching uh, right now. So uh, this is work in progress and I'm eagerly looking forward to, to your comments. Now, my paper investigates how scientific methods used to evaluate states' risk management vis-a-vis -vis climate change can be operationalized in legal terms and potentially applied in the context of climate litigation. There is a legal argument that has been emerging according to which states' acts and omissions that contribute to climate change can amount to a violation of states' human rights obligations. However, there is no clarity or consensus as to the specific content of states' obligations relating to climate change, uh, for example, in terms of mitigation levels. To explore ways of how the nature of these obligations can be specified, I draw on the, uh, on the work by a scientific NGO called uh, Climate Action Tracker. And this research organization assesses government climate action against the 2 to 1.5 degree target of the Paris Agreement, and it rates countries into six different categories. In terms of structure, I'll uh, start with a brief doctrinal analysis of the legal argument, then I focus on cuts rating methodology, and the third part integrates the legal considerations with cut scientific findings. Now, the risks humanity is facing due to anthropogenic climate change are well known. The IPCC has, among others, identified a risk such as a risk of death, injury, severe ill health, and disrupted or loss of livelihoods. Several international bodies, such as the UN Human Rights Council, have recognized a link between climate change and human rights. But so far, none of these international bodies has uh, spoken of a violation of uh, human rights in this context. However, international instruments have been used on the domestic level by the Dutch Supreme Court in its recent landmark uh, agenda judgment to identify a threatened violation of uh, human rights due to climate change. The court found, among others, that the right to life and the right to respect for private and family life in the European Convention on Human Rights give rise to state positive obligations in the context of climate change. And the court ordered Dutch government to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. The Dutch court based its interpretation of the relevant ECHR articles on case law by the European Court of Human Rights, more specifically on the ECTHR's real intermediate risk doctrine. Likewise, a legal argument has been emerging in international legal scholarship according to which state responsibility for adverse effects of climate change on human rights can be established on the basis of existing norms of international human rights law. Human rights in question are, among others, the right to life, the right to the highest attainable standard of health, the right to self-determination, just to name a few. Now, in this context, a number of questions arise. What is the specific content of state's obligations relating to climate change? What exactly constitutes an omission or internationally wrongful act? What levels of emission reductions are required of states to live up to their human rights obligations? To tackle these questions, it appears essential to integrate legal considerations with findings from climate sciences. To explore ways to do so, um, the rest of my paper draws on the scientific assessment of state climate action by the Climate Action Tracker. CUTS is made up of climate scientists and policy analysis from two research organizations, Climate Analytics and the New Climate Institute. CUTS is working closely uh, with the PIC, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, um, which is also a former CUT consortium member and obviously a close collaborator of the UN's International Panel on Climate Change. CAT rates government climate action against the 2 to 1.5 degree target of the Paris Agreement and it ranks countries into six different categories critically insufficient, highly insufficient, insufficient, 2 degrees compatible, 1.5 degrees compatible, and role model. CAT's analyses are based on 40 studies used by the IPCC and additional calculations run by the CAT. As of now, out of 33 countries analyzed by CAT, covering approximately 80% of global emissions, 10 are rated as insufficient and 15 as highly or critically insufficient. 
the Paris Agreement specifies that state risk management vis a vis climate change it needs to reflect the highest possible ambition and common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. These obviously are highly general obligations. What CUTS offers um, is an assessment of what exactly is needed of states to achieve the goal of limiting global warming to 2 or 1.5 degrees. CAT also offers possible interpretations of what each country's fair share uh, should be. Instead of deciding itself what is fair, CAT constructs a range of options that different scholars consider to be fair. Catherine shows what temperature rise these different options would lead to. Each rating category reflects the temperature increase that would come about if all other states were to undertake uh, risk management with the same relative ambition level. Notably, CAT uh, rates the least stringent part of this fair share range as insufficient, as according to its analyses, it would lead to a warming of two to three degrees. Now, for these um, scientific findings to be used in the legal context, they need to be operationalized, so to speak. The reason why this is necessary can maybe best be expressed in statistical terminology. Cuts, uh, cuts, um, cuts findings are presented on a scale in six categories. For use in the legal context, however, we somehow need to recode this scale, this continuum, into binary terms. Which level of risk management, which rating category, translates into a compliance with states' obligations in the context of climate change, and which into a violation of these obligations? Now, how did the Dutch court, in its groundbreaking judgment that I mentioned earlier, go about the complex task of deciding what level of emission reductions is needed for the Dutch state to comply with its obligations? The court found that the Dutch state has an obligation to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by at least 25% compared to 1990. How did the court set this target? The main factor the court seems to base its decision on is the extent to which there is support within the international community for such a target. The court is of the opinion that specifying state's positive obligations and each, each state's share in redu reducing greenhouse gas emissions belongs in principle to the political domain and that states will have to agree on this amongst themselves. By among others, referring to statements made by the UNFCCC COP conferences up to 2015, the court finds that there is a high degree of international consensus on the urgent need for Annex 1 countries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 25 to 40 percent by 2020 compared to 1990 levels. This figure is taken from a scenario contained in an IPCC assessment report of 2007 which said that such a reduction is needed so that global warming is reasonably expected to be limited to a maximum of two degrees. As the court used its role as ensuring that the state is complying at least with its minimum obligation, it settles on the figure of 25%. Now, how does this compare to CAPS assessment? CAPS evaluation is based on scenarios contained in the latest IPCC report and it is continuously updated with the latest figures on global and national emissions, which obviously have cha changed quite a bit since 2007 when the assessment report by the ICC was published from which the target, the 25 to 40% target was taken. CAPS finds that for the EU, the Netherlands is not rated individually, but for the EU, a 25% reduction falls at the least stringent end of CATS fair share range. According to CATS, if all other countries were to adopt the same relative ambition level, that, that would lead to a global warming higher than, than two degrees and almost three degrees. Now, the Dutch court itself notes that it has been recognized for some years that global warming should not be limited to a maximum of two degrees to prevent dangerous climate change, but to a maximum of 1.5 degrees, and that it is possible that dangerous climate change will occur even with less global warming and a lower concentration of greenhouse gases. This brings me to argue that the question of what the positive obligation of states should mean in concrete terms belongs not only to the political or judicial domain, but the scientific one as well. Of course, a judicial reasoning based on Katz's approach would not be immune to criticism. Katz is an NGO, one might point, for example, to possible legitimacy issues. 
However, I argue that there is great value in tax analysis for the way forward in specifying state obligations in terms of climate mitigation. CAT offers a transparent and objective way of tackling this complex task, among others with assessments based on the latest emission figures. Basing decisions on this approach could arguably enhance the legitimacy of lawmaking and judicial bodies in this field. Thank you very much.